Okay, so um, welcome. Welcome to Let's Talk Leadership. I'm joined by my friend and colleague, uh, Ira Morris here. Hi, Ira. Um, Hi, Ian. Good morning. Well. How are you? I'm very good. And thank you so much for joining us today for this session. So we're going to have a short, I say short session, but 10, 15 minutes on a few topics. Now, what do I need to share um, with the with the listeners about you? So you're living in The Hague. In That's the right. Now with your, with your wife and your two daughters. But you're not um, originally from that part of the world. You've, um, I think you were, you were originally from Chicago. Is that right? That's right. Exactly. People never really believe it because they can't really hear it in my accent. But um, yeah, I was born in Chicago and then... When I was seven, uh, the family and I moved to Berlin. So I lived there for a few years. And then we moved to England when I was 12. And now Where I've been here in the UK. Where you living? I forget now. Where was that? Yeah, just to the west of London. Um, oh. A little village called Bourne End, uh, which is near Marlow, Maidenhead, yeah. High Wycombe, that kind of area. So, nice, nice. The yeah. home counties and that kind of corner Indeed. on that side. Excellent. And um, you have many interests outside of the work that we do together. And we, we've, you know, we've met through work and client work that we've done together. But you like a bit of um, rowing and cycling, long distance cycling, right? Exactly. Because, you know, as you, as you probably know from your experience in the Netherlands, here we have lots of uh, cycle paths that kind of crisscross the country. Yeah. And so you can cycle you know, to your heart's content along the coast. And it's uninterrupted. It's, it's separate from the road. So I enjoy cycling through the dunes, uh, sometimes up to 100 kilometers round trip. Wow. And you're on your own and uh, enjoying the fresh air, the view of the sea. Um, so, yeah, so it's a good way to kind of uh, stay fit and also kind of process experiences during the week and things like that. So, so that's good fun. For you, I mean, you cycling together or on your own mostly? Well, sometimes with a group of friends, it might be like a couple of us. So it's, it, it's a mix. Um, so, you know, in the current situation, I try and cycle at least maybe three or four times a week, and then one long distance ride at the weekend. And sometimes it's with a friend of mine, sometimes on my own. Okay. So. I'm sure for many people that have a um, more of a long distance study that running or cycling is a meditative mm -hmm. type exactly. of process of where to process and obviously to be more resilient. So um, that's right. Thanks for that. So the other thing that we have in common, we have children mm -hmm. and you have two daughters. And what was interesting with, with my children, they're a little bit older than yours right now, was growing up, I got involved with football. As a, mm. as a soccer coach and a soccer referee, but your involvement with your children's pastime, your two daughters, took a different path into horse riding. Is that right? That's right. Yes. When they were uh, quite small, uh, so five and seven at that time, uh, we took them to the stables. Uh, we had a mutual friend who was really into horse riding. So they started their uh, horse riding classes and being very polite and, uh, dare I say it, rather British, I talked to the instructor. I said, do you also teach adults? And he, should, he said, sure. How about tomorrow? And I said, well, it's okay. Let me think about it. <laughs> and my wife said, what a great idea. Why don't we try that? So, so I started a little bit after my uh, children. And so we continue to ride to this day. We have lessons once or twice a week at the moment. So, so it's like seven or eight years, right? So it's, it's that's right. Time now. Yeah, exactly. Of course. But you didn't stop there, right? You saw an opportunity. So tell me about how you went from being a horse rider and enjoying horses with your, with your two daughters to bring it into our industry, into our world. So how did that happen? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's, there's something very special uh, about horses. And we can, we'll talk about that perhaps in, in a few moments. So um, I actually joined a, um, a webinar uh, through um, someone based in uh, North Carolina. Her company is called Teaching Horse. And so she had a webinar back in 2017, and she talked about how she brings horses into her work with individuals and teams. So to really give them the experience of learning more about themselves, uh, learning more about how they work with each other as an intact team. I thought, wow, that's actually a pretty cool uh, way of working, very experiential and very profound. So I looked into that in terms of, you know, how does one um, become um, sort of, you know, how does one become a to offer such a service as part of a leadership development program. And so I did some further work uh, at the beginning of 2019. And now I have a couple of clients who I work with. Uh, and um, it's profound in so many different ways. Uh, firstly, I love horses. Yeah. And I, my belief about development is really about focusing not only on the cognitive. So for example, building skills, although that's clearly very important, but really developing somebody at a holistic level. So cognitive, emotional, somatic, and, and spiritual as well, to some extent. So is it true? So I, I even, my, my sister, she did some horse riding years ago, and I was really scared when, mm. I, went when I was younger, you know, looking up at these huge horses and yes. having a scar on my head right. where, I was, um, where I was in the stables, and my, daughter, and my, my, my sister was about to have some, some coaching and training, 
yeah. and, and the horse kicked the door. Right. It was almost Gosh. like the horse sensed that I was scared. Yes. And, I, and I turned and I just caught my head on a bit of metal. Oh, oh and, that's beautiful. Um, and it, but it was interesting because I was clearly showing up as somebody who was um, not comfortable. Yeah. I know I wasn't particularly, um, I was scared, if you like, of these horses. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure yeah. the horse could sense that. And this yes. is part of this process, right? It's, it's, you talk about affinity, I think, if that's the right exactly. term. And also the way you show up, your attention, your focus, and your, in yeah. your being, your state of being. And Indeed. the horse can sense that. Right. They can sense it very well. And I think that's part of their beauty, part of their power. Mm-hmm. And so people might ask, well, what does it mean to be coached when working with horses? You know, what does that look like? And the first thing to say is that you're not actually riding the horse. You're on the ground alongside the horse. And so, you know, as, as you say, they're very impressive, very large animals. So there's something about, for many people, a sense of trepidation. Yeah. It's quite a grand animal and um so a lot of people have some degree of um, anxiety or some concern about being in their presence and because they're what we call herd animals I means they're very social they're used to being with their you know with other horses but also they're prey animals um so that means that they collectively need to really pay attention to their environment so they have highly attuned antennae that detects signals in their environment to ensure that they're safe and that there's a sense of harmony uh, in the herd of horses. doesn't mean there is not competition for leadership amongst the herd, um, but those qualities um, are very um, powerful, very effective when we bring individuals and teams to work with horses because if someone is anxious, as you, as you say from your own experience, they'll pick that up. We talk about that in terms of congruence. So is your internal energy aligned with your external behavior. And if there's discrepancy, the horse without judgment, this is also part of their power in terms of helping us grow as individuals and leaders, um, they will give you that feedback because they're not censoring their feedback. They have no need to. um, And they're doing it in service of their own needs as well. So how you show up is very much mirrored by by the horses. And so... uh, um there's a yeah. big element of trust. It's a good way to illustrate trust because if you don't trust yourself in this moment, yeah, and um, but you say something which would indicate that you are strong, powerful, or, or very yes. convinced about a course of action, if the yeah. horse doesn't buy that for whatever reason, no. instinctively, they'll just you know they won't follow you. Yeah, well, and you won't be able to get them to do anything, or they won't choose to do anything. Whatever you do, right? You have to exactly. Yeah. It, it's exactly right. And I think they have to, I think as leaders, this is where it has applicability, I think, to our everyday life. We have to think about why is it interesting for the horse to follow me? So, you know, in organizations, you know, one can use role authority. Um, so you have to follow the boss, but we know that's not the most effective way of doing it. But when we think about the horse, you've got really two things you're focusing on. One is connecting with the horse. So how do we know when we connect with a horse? Or how do we know when we connect with someone else? And then also we try and lead the horse. Again, you're on the ground. You're not using any lead ropes. You're encouraging the horse to follow you. It has to be interesting for the horse. Yeah. So we often focus on rewarding the horse by saying, let's say, good boy, as opposed to, you know, come on, come on. And the horse then will respond, you know, if you can create an environment where the horse thinks, oh, this is also interesting for me to follow you. So there's connection. There's some affection as well, I guess. Yes. Now, can you tell me a story... I forget if you were out walking and you met, was it a wild horse or a horse in another field somewhere that you that's right. built a connection with? Exactly. In the moment kind of thing? Yeah, that's right. So I was, I was there with my riding instructor with whom I also do this equine assisted coaching work. Yeah. So we were thinking about how do we support leaders in the current situation with COVID-19. And um, so we're in the field with the horses that belong to the stables uh, where we do our work. Yeah. And they have a new horse uh, that they've just recently purchased. And for some unknown reason, the horse kind of approached me um, and there was something about affinity. So, you know, there is that kind of sense of mystery, like why, why is there that, that connection? And we know with, with colleagues and with friends, we connect more with some and less with others. And there's no, no, no real obvious explanation for that. Um, so there's an affinity, uh, which just happens almost kind of magically in some ways. I think then the other point to add to that would be this point about attention. So how do we work with horses where we don't have that natural affinity? So the horse will detect whether we are noticing 
the horse or not? And also the question is, even before that, are we noticing what's going on for us personally? So I do, do I really want to connect with this horse or am I feeling distracted or you know, do I sense there's a, maybe even a bit of competition with the horse? And how, how do we find some congruence, some alignment, even if there isn't that natural affinity? And this is all the kind of things that we would cover in, in a workshop. And people really learn for themselves, you know, what does it mean to attend to me as a person, not only in my head, but also in my body. This is what I mean about doing work at a somatic level. Yeah. And I know with some sessions I've run in the past, where someone really wanted this to work because they're there with their colleagues, they're probably feeling a bit self-conscious, they're being observed. And so they're very much in their head. Okay, the horse will follow, follow me. I want the horse to follow me. And yet it's not happening. And so we invite the person to think about where, well, to really reflect on a time from the past where they're really in a state of flow. You know, so think about a time either at work or outside of work when you were just totally absorbed in what you were doing. Now recall that moment viscerally. Yeah. So put yourself back into that situation. Now connect with the horse and see what happens. And then oftentimes what we notice is, is that the horse will then follow that individual. So they go from being in their head to being in their body. And the energy, as we said earlier, the horse will detect that, that sense of alignment, you know, that sense of, I, I can identify with you as, as someone I want to follow. And it's very, very powerful for, for that I, individual. Imagine I'm on a program then where you, know, you and I are designed in, we'll come to how we sell this to clients in a moment, because I'm sure yeah. you know, you're an innovator, you're, you like working with entrepreneurs, and, and we'll come back to it in a moment, these smart leaders who yes. embrace different ways. But if I'm a participant and I've been through a process like this or I'm going through it, yeah. um, of course, I could say at the end, well, I, I don't work with horses. I'm not right. in stables. I don't run that type of business. I'm not yeah. racing. And um, how does this apply to me in the workplace? I can start to see some connections. But how do you position it to make it totally applicable to colleagues, clients, stakeholders? Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a great question. I think the most important place to start, really, with, with your question there. So... We invite people to think about a question they want to address. Now, the link between the question and the horses might not be obvious at first. Um, and equally, we could ask people to think about a particular challenge that they're dealing with. Okay. So, for example, recently I worked with a leadership team um, at a university, and they, they, their challenge was, hey, we're all doing our own work individually, the five of us. We're not really connected as a team. Our challenge is how do we work more closely with each other? And how do we have an agenda in the university so we're not only a support function, but we can sort of promote what we're doing? So that was a presenting question. And then we create a series of, of exercises, both individual and team, where people explore that particular question. And I think, you know, a bit like yourself, you know, we, we rely on different theories or models or frameworks of leadership. So it's not kind of without some input. So we might give a very simple model of leadership. Mm -hmm. and invite people to think about where do you feel you are on this model uh, and what is it you want to practice? So for this group, it was really about their sense of leadership, their sense of vision, um, and also the sense of connection with one another. So, um, so that's, that's how you start. And then you design the exercises accordingly you know, to, to link to their challenge. It's nice, isn't it? Because um, yeah. that's, that's causing you and your colleagues that, that work on these topics to be more creative as well about, hmm, okay, so how do we help in this situation? Because we know this typically works, but how can we make it work? So how do you sell this to some of the people? So in our business, mm. we are not selling to the people who are enjoying the programs that we run, whether yeah. it has um, you know, a horse element in terms of learning or not, but we're selling to people who obviously have the budgets. And they yes. can be a bit more cynical to say, well, well, prove to me this works. So how do you, how do you either convince yeah. or influence as you do that? It's a great, it's a great question. I think, I think a lot of people are afraid of this, to be honest with you. So I know of teams where they're very keen to do this work, but the leader didn't support the idea because I think, although this was never really expressed as such, and it's only a hypothesis, so it could be, it could be wrong on this point. But, you know, it involves being willing to show yourself, show who you are in front of your colleagues. Um, so that's the starting point. And, you know, are you up for, for really uh, putting yourself in a position where, how you show up will be mirrored by the horse, you know, or the good, the good, the bad, and the ugly, as it were. The real vulnerability. Very much, real vulnerability, yeah. yes. And I think that's where the learning 
comes from. I think that's the first thing to say. The second thing is, you know, although a lot of work that you and I do is very much sort of, you know, classroom based and, and, and so on and so forth. This goes obviously by definition out of the classroom. Yeah. So if you, if you work with leaders and they say, you know, we've done some really good classroom learning, we want to try something a little bit different, um, something quite profound, something very experiential. You know, that's something that can appeal to, to, to individuals. I think the, um, I mean, the, the, the proof is in the pudding. So for skeptics, um, I guess what gives them some reassurance is that we say that we are facilitators first and horse people second. Yeah. And it's a matter of choice. Some people might prefer to work with those uh, providers who are horse people first and facilitators second. That's a good choice that one would make. But we emphasize our experience of you know, being in leadership roles and supporting leaders in organizations. And this is sort of an additional uh, provision that, that we can offer or additional service. Mm-hmm. And I think it's um, starting small. You know, so just start maybe with a half-day session, get a feel for it. And um, it's becoming a little bit more mainstream, I think. It's funny, isn't it? Because we, the, these, um, these alternative medicines, if you like, to lead, the leadership illness that we're all trying to, to, to deal yeah. with. And in fact, we, we, we had a session plan where myself and some colleagues were going to sample this. So it would be really interesting to maybe come back in a future session, uh, Let's Talk Leadership, having me had the experience. We can come back yes. to these points. I think it'd be lovely to see that and I'm looking forward to um to having a go myself yeah thank you for that one last thing as we as we wind up you said as we prepared for this chat uh, you spoke about the concept of smart leaders you enjoy Mm. working with smart leaders yes let's finish on that how would you define a smart leader yeah it's it's uh, I'm not quite sure why I have that interest but I but I know that I do and it's I guess it's because I have a background in, in biotech So I'm used to working with medics who are PhDs, surgeons, MBAs. So very, very cerebral, very bright people Mm -hmm. creating cutting edge um, medical solutions, you know, uh, therapeutics, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I also enjoy working in the tech sector. So people who create software for autonomous vehicles, for example, is is part of their mission at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I enjoy working with those people uh, because they're trying to solve very complicated problems, and they're very committed um, to that endeavor. I think where this comes in is to complement their skills in solving very complex problems to help them deal with you know, issues and challenges in managing a team of people, managing the organization. So it's smart in terms of intellect, in terms of smarts, in terms of cognitive skills, and this complements what, what they uh, what they focus on in terms of their skill sets. So it makes them more well-rounded, I think, as, as individuals. And it's um, sometimes where they find a bit more, you know, life a bit more challenging. How do I motivate people who are very different to me? How do I make sense of ambiguity? You know, those kind of complex problems that they have to deal with in everyday life. So that's something I find very interesting. And it's, of course, very relevant in the world that we're living in today as we're transitioning into um you know, all the after effects of uh, what's creating this, this distance between us. So it's, um, you know, these learnings from the horse experience, these um, working with intelligent people, but are struggling in some more yeah. complex environments right now, the chaos Indeed. they're living in, it's, it's a challenge, right? Exactly, very much so. And I, I think, you know, when you work with the horses, it's actually very exhausting by the time you finish. So because it's touched you, not only at a cerebral or cognitive level, but touched your heart mm. and your body. And so... Uh, I've had this experience as a participant, but also as a facilitator. I see how tired people are. And it's a satisfied feeling of tiredness as opposed to you know, feeling spent or exhausted. But it, it's when we talk about transformation, I think things shift when you're just simply in the presence of horses and you're really in touch with your whole being um, you know, as you connect with a horse and you try and lead. And it's, things shift through that experience. Uh, mm-hmm. And what's important as well, just to finish with maybe, is it's free of judgment. There's no right or wrong. It doesn't matter if you can't do the exercise with a horse. It's more about what are you noticing and what do your colleagues notice about you in the spirit of curiosity and compassion, I think, which is really... There's important. a great mind, a mindset and a mind shift, maybe. Yeah. I'm curious, if we go back to the beginning of the talk today, we started this with your involvement with horses and horse mm-hmm. riding some seven or so years ago. Yeah. Your daughters were learning to ride. Um, did they find it easier to ride and to connect with horses than you or the other way around? Yes, thanks, thanks for the question. <laughs> they did, and, and simply because they don't think about it. Mm. 
that's the beauty, you know. And I think as adults, when we learn, and we obviously continue to learn, that's that's what we find in our profession. Um, you know, we, we often rely on our cognitive skills. And for younger people, when they're learning to ride horses, they feel it. And what my rider instructor says to me, feel your connection with the horse. Don't think about it. It doesn't mean you should not think. Of course, you should. Um, it's more about being well-rounded. So the, the girls are naturally more skilled already as horse riders than I ever will be, you know, which is great for them. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your passions, giving us your insights. We will have part two once I've had the uh, the pleasure of working with you and the team to experience it myself. But for now, thank you so much, Ira. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Ian. Enjoy and, the conversation. It was very Look forward very to the next time. But thanks for your time and, uh, and your efforts. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah. Okay. Wish you well. Take care. Yep.